Hey, what's going on guys? Welcome everybody watching live and on the replay to Wasabi Wednesday. Oh, so excited to have you here guys. This is a weekly Facebook live show on love, dating, relationships, connection, all the things that make life worth living in my uh, human connection, right? We are all here fundamentally to connect with each other and we have a special guest host, Miss Poppy Sprague is here with us and I'm super excited to have her. Let's see if we can add her onto the show. We are. Uh, I cannot wait to talk to Poppy. She is absolutely brilliant. All right. Nicholas, Nichols, how you doing, my friend? Everybody jumping on live or on the replay. We're so happy to have you here. We did it. Hey. Hey. What is up, darling? How are you? I'm brilliant. Nice to see you. Are we going to change so nice the world? Yeah, I'm so happy to have you here. What's up, Thomas Amaro, Hannah Elizabeth, Cinnamon Schmidt. How are you doing, guys? Welcome to everybody to Wasabi Wednesday. Uh, I was Poppy. I was just telling them a little about a little bit about what this show is about: dating, love, and connection. And so, when I was thinking about who do I want to have on as my guest host to talk to about this topic, you were like top of my list of people to talk to because I just love you and everything that you're about. So. Why don't you tell the audience a little bit about you and your background and, and what you're passionate about? Oh, wow. Well, I'm passionate about people. People are my religion. Um, I'm a mm. psychologist, psychotherapist, coach, and I do all kinds of things to just share what I know clinically, but equally as a human being. I, I like you, you know, I'm truly honored to be here, Matt. Like mm. you and Rebecca, I self-disclose a lot, and I think that's very much in the co coaching community. We do that, is use ourselves. Um, yeah. and, and really quite vulnerably, because it's leading from the front. Psychotherapy, they don't do that so much in that profession. So I love to integrate mm -hmm. the two to see what's going on with us, what do we want, and how do we get there collectively, rather than just on our own, struggling with our own stuff, you know? So I'm, Absolutely. I'm a great fan of us talking online like this and sharing so that people have an opportunity to see that it's doable on a public forum to talk about the things that matter. Absolutely. And I couldn't agree with you more. And yeah, I love the whole what you threw out there about the collective versus the individual. And truly, uh, we are all in this together. And I think people, when they isolate, when they cut themselves off from, uh, from connection, to other people, that's when the suffering really, uh, really starts to take hold, I think, for a lot of people. So it's important that we have vulnerable, co connected conversations and we bring people into it. Dahlia Ramahi, good to see you, my dear. And uh, Poppy, if you could take a second and while we're talking and just share this I uh, did. on your page. Done. That we... Done. Done. You're on and that's it, girl. it. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. So Poppy, I, I love it. So let's let's start to dive in because I know you and I are gonna like go deep. Dive into what we're what we're talking about today and your psychotherapy background and everything that you've been your your clinical background uh, is I think gonna really help here. Talk about well, let's let's talk about connection and communication in relationship. And guys, this is your opportunity. Everybody watching live, uh, chime in. Let us know what comes up for you guys around connecting and communicating with other people, particularly in dating and relationships. I think it's a really, it's a tough spot for a lot of people, you know? Yeah, big time. And I, and I guess this is why I do what I do really these days, working with, uh, it's not a term I'm a fan of, but in psychiatry, we call it the worried well. So those of us that are a little bit neurotic as opposed to really, really mentally unwell which happens yeah. to the best of us. And that's the result of, it is, keeping ourselves strum about the important things. So my background is in psychiatry, working in prisons and mental health institutions. I've also been in one myself for myself because I did exactly what I said don't do. Um, yep. So where I work is upstream, as it were, is to look at prevention because we all have mental health, just like we have physical health and they affect one another. So if we can get on and shift the culture again, you know, as a collective of how we talk about these issues, because communication issues within uh, intimate relationships come from, you know, two people, the history of how they grew up, what was okay to talk about, what wasn't, and that manifests in the now, and we end up with the same issues that we had in the home life 
in the now life and become our parents unless we get to reflect on what are my sort of learning edges and how do I get to cut the cord on the family dynamic and do it differently in a healthy way? Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> and uh, I'll, I'll share again, like that was a big breakthrough for me when I realized, because I always had a really tough time with confrontation in, in relationship with, with women. Like it was very hard for me to say or bring up anything that I knew the person that I was with wasn't gonna like. I mean, it, st it still is to this day. <laughs> But before, like, I just avoided it. And I never really understood why yeah. until I realized that my parents, and I found out, I forget how I even found out about this, but my parents had a rule uh, that uh, they weren't allowed to disagree in front of the kids. Wow. Oh, so gosh. my okay. entire child, and they're, they're, my parents are beautiful people. I love them to death, and they love each other, and they, they gave me an incredible life. Uh, but that, that little rule they had, they thought they were protecting me, right? Of course. By, tell, by never arguing in front of the kids. They never I never saw them have a disagreement. Yeah. They had to be a united front at all times, you yeah. know? And so I didn't know that people in a relationship disagreed. Yeah. So, you know, that was a forbidden zone. So I didn't. So when I started having feelings that were contra contrary to that, it was really, uh, it brought up a ton of stuff for me just to be able to have. And so I would just bottle stuff up until I exploded. You know, of course. Then I, would just, then I would just run away from the relationship or I disconnect and bail. Yeah, of course. It's a setup for failure and difficulty and conflict. And this is what I say because anger as an emotion and conflict are my favorite things because it's so clear where it comes from. But the intention, as you say, is about usually keeping the peace. And this is the thing about humanity is where we got the idea that, you know, life is supposed to be comfortable and easy is, you know, completely contorted. Those that yeah. struggle with conflict find themselves in conflict because we gravitate to the things that we push away, obviously. Yeah. And, you know, I was a family and group and a couple psychotherapists for many years, and it was extraordinary, the stories, the rational stories about why parenting was done in this kind of a way which don't rock the boat keep the peace and that blocked people from uh being able to not necessarily disagree but to challenge hang on a minute i have a different view or how about x y and z and we're just very very poor at having these kinds of conversations oftentimes the couple wants the same thing it's just the language and the intention gets lost and it gets into you know, being defensive, for example. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so why, why do you think that it gets lost? Because so many times couples are on the same page or they want the same thing or they want to feel the same way, but they're not able or willing to, to get it across to their partner in an effective way. What do you think is, comes up there that blocks it or that, that, that throws it off? Well, I think it's kind of a, you know, Tony Robbins talks about this, that if we follow the stress, we find our deepest fear. And ultimately, mm. we all fear that it's true that we're not worthy, we're not good enough. And of course, underneath that is, if I'm not good enough, I'm not lovable. So mm -hmm. again, what we're doing is being pain avoidant is, oh, if I'm a good girl, if I'm a good boy, if I say yes, sir, no, sir, three bags full, everybody's happy. And mm -hmm. people resent it don't feel safe in it because we know instinctively there's another message underneath the verbal one and we yeah. start to get really insecure and this is what jealousy is about jealousy is about what's missing namely the communication or the inability to see your good qualities so mm. I mean that's what I would say to it is oftentimes it can be about you didn't take care of the kids in the way I wanted you to or you looked at her or you know you don't let me play in the band or whatever it is. There's sort of nuances as to what the issue is, which is symptomatic yeah. of the fear of not being loved for who you are. Uh, you know, warts yeah. and all kind of thing. Absolutely. Would, would, would so, you agree with that? Would, where do you come from on oh, that one? I would say that, you know, and I talked about this a little while ago with, uh, with another guest, but the, yeah, that, uh, that, that feedback and being able to really like, really share vulnerably, it's all comes down to vulnerability, yeah. like anger, conflict and confrontation is really a willingness to be vulnerable about the feelings that you've got coming up and being able to go there with your person, yeah. even when those feelings and thoughts and, and stuff, even when that stuff is not necessarily, you know, gentle. Yes. Like it's being able to be like, I'm, I'm fucking pissed off right now. 
you know, and this is how I'm being triggered. And this is the story that I'm making up about it. And being able to give feedback and, and have that dialogue with somebody with the understanding that the other person isn't going to take it personally, you know, that, that both people can have like a constructive dialogue, even when they're saying things that are, 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 are a little, you know, confrontational. And I think that's, that's absolutely critical. And guys, this is your opportunity. If you have questions for us, stuff coming up around <clears throat> communication, connection and relationship, this is your chance to, to ask me, ask Poppy. Uh, and we're happy to, we're happy to wrap on this stuff with you yeah. guys. Paige says here, it appears that my husband and I project emotions onto each other. He's gotten better about taking time for himself. He doesn't want to do or say anything that will, that will trigger me. Interesting. So Paige, so Paige, how does that make you feel? Are you saying, do you feel isolated by the way that he's treating you? Do you feel shut out? Does it make you feel jealous or insecure? Because that's an interesting, uh, that's an interesting thought that when we do this, that when we think we're saving ourselves from this person by, by not sharing their stuff, yeah, it's, it's actually giving them a deeper, it's like weakening the foundation of the relationship, isn't it? Yeah. Well, if I could say, I'll give an example of something like that. I mean, Paige, my love, welcome to the human race. I imagine a lot of people here can identify with it. Firstly, we don't often have the dialogue. We don't have the modeling of how to do this, how to have the conversation. So, of course, by the time we do, it's stacked. We're frustrated about so much or hurt about so much. So people come to blows or they ghost each other or have affairs or whatever it is. It's often not about what we want outside of the relationship. It's that we get to a point where we don't like who we are in the relationship. So we, you know, go looking for something else, whether it's, you know, whatever distraction. But I'll give an example of, I think, Paige, you can give some feedback, my love, if this resonates. I had a couple come to me once, and this was so often the thing, is they wanted the same thing. So he was very passive. She was very uh, controlling, because she was very, very insecure. So he wouldn't want to upset her. Mm. And it stacked to the point, and this is, I had six couples in that same year that did this, came to the point that, of course, he would eat things he didn't want to eat because she wanted to eat it, yada, yada, yada. And he left her at the altar, which is the ultimate screw you, right? I'm going to have some control. Six clients did this that year. It was extraordinary. And I thought, I'm supposed to be an expert in this now because I'm getting challenged with it. But as Mm. we unpacked it, they stayed together and ended up with an incredible relationship for this reason, that we explored what is it you want. And she wanted him to be more assertive and say, you know, back off, love. I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. She wanted that kind of masculine part of him that he'd suppressed yeah. and there's a story of course why he was suppressing it and he wanted her to be more feminine and more kind of i'll trust you to you know impress me just because you're here not because you doing the things i want you to do and i think this is often what happens particularly when uh one of the couples has had relationships where somebody's up you know had an affair or been abusive that the other couple the other person will pander to it as opposed to model well we can have a different relationship this is how it is to be in a healthy relationship oftentimes people cut their needs off because they don't want to upset the person because they had a hard time the last time and it's a set martyrdom doesn't work martyrdom doesn't work in a a relationship It, it really doesn't you know and, and isn't it, I, I love what you said there because this is directly in alignment with my own experience is that a lot of times people who have a tendency to be passive and non-confrontational like we do, it, it all bottles up and stacks, like yeah. you said, until the way that we blow up is to leave. Yes. The way that we finally release that pressure is to run away, yes. you know, and that's the, and, and that's the destructive too in like a totally different way yes. uh, when we, when we do that. And Paige, Paige said, that she feels like she has to walk on eggshells, like she has to be too careful uh, w- with him because of how he, how he is. And uh, yeah, that she has to be too careful. I'd like him to feel better, more, more resourced, more supported, I guess is what she's, uh, what she's saying. Yeah. Well, it's mm. that kind of old adage that men want their women to be happy and women want their men to be present. And if we ain't happy, they ain't present because they take it yeah. personally. Is that true? Yeah. Oh my gosh. It, yeah. Well, man, I mean, if we feel, yeah, like we want to, we want to do things to make them happy, right? Like we, we love that. But if, if they're just continually like, we want to fix it, right? Yeah. Men want to fix it. We want to do the thing, 
fix it and make everybody happy. And then when women are just like, no matter what we do, they're not happy. We eventually just, we check out, right? Because nothing we do yeah. is working. Yeah. <laughs> and the thing with us, our culture is we are phenomenal at passive aggression, you know, meaning suppress the anger and then act out like a blinking child, which always backfires. And there's a world yeah. expert in addictions, Dr. Robert Lefevre, and he says, and I agree with him, that compulsive helping, i.e. people pleasing, is the most acceptable addiction in our culture. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, codependency and all of this stuff that we can dive into, because if somebody's on here going, oh gosh, this applies, no yeah. shame in it, we've been set up to have this situation completely backfire. And it gets dangerous, Matt, this is where you know, my history professionally and personally comes in is people go quite mad. Cut off, yeah. become sort of relationally anorexic. I'm not going to go there because it's painful. Um, mm. Or act out or get aggressive. And as we say, it stacks and we blow up. Or people get very emotionally drained. Chronic fatigue, oh. adrenal fatigue, cancer, mental health issues, you name it. It's unsustainable yep. for us to be happy all the time and I, oftentimes I'll meet with couples and they'll say well we never argue and they're proud of it and I'm like well that's where we're going wrong because <laughs> we all have anger within us mm -hmm. because we get angry as a response to trespass so we get to talk about it and that's where the passion is for couples this is often where couples run off and they're all in love again is when they get to be passionate to say what it yeah. is they want and don't want and that's all boundaries are yes and no and knowing where to put them basically absolutely absolutely and it seems like we got a lot of people pleasers on which is no surprise given that i am like the ultimate one of those yes uh, it's an epidemic tucker, it, it really is yeah tucker says uh tucker my buddy tucker bin hey buddy good to see you man uh you can't stand that eggshell feeling it puts a knot in your gut and it can come up across the board relationships business or friendship that's so true because you're self-conscious about being yourself for fear that the other person is going to bring you down or be reactive to you. And I mean, yeah, I think a lot of people, so what do you tell, like what sort of coaching do you give people? What sort of guidance do you give people who are looking to overcome this people pleasing and fear of confrontation to, so that they can have that level of connection and communication in a constructive, not a destructive way? Like how do you, what, what do you tell people? Like, it's like generally even a lot of people uh, are sick of being exhausted by this stuff and I know I know I am too. and it is exhausting the emotions <clears throat> and the energy to push the emotions away it is exhausting whether we're conscious of it or not so firstly what I would do and I recommend it for anybody is I do a masterclass of sorts whether it's online and live coaching group coaching or individually is to become absolutely masterful with boundaries and that mm -hmm. for us uncovers the people pleasing, the chronic, chronic addiction to compulsive helping and being a good girl or a good boy and looks at where it came from. Because usually if we're on eggshells, it's an absolute replica of mum being a bit histrionic or neurotic or whatever it is. We learn this mm -hmm. stuff. We become experts, really creative stuff, but it backfires in adulthood. So how I look at this and, you know, it's a sort of, I would say 100% kind of release and relief for people is to be able to know what an emotion is and embrace anger as a very healthy emotion is what we do with the emotions that becomes the uncomfortable, unhelpful, yeah. unhealthy stuff. So it's and so right there, before you keep... Yeah, before you keep going, I just want to like emphasize that point because I think it's super important that there are no bad emotions. None that all emotions are just feedback, right? They're all just information and they can be tools to help us what? Sit, become more aware of who we are and what, we're, what, we're, what we respond to. And then we can use them, right? Even if they don't feel good yes. in the moment, they're all really valuable tools if you, if you allow them to be. Absolutely, there's a message in them. So if we allow to just have a sense of it, because they're in the body, it's just energy. You can feel, mm -hmm. for example, pain is in the chest, anger's in the head and the hands, etc. We can feel to the place and ask a question, which is, what's the message? And it will usually be something very, very simple. It's the soul's message. This is not okay. That was painful. 
I really yeah. like this person. I need. It's very simple. We're an oracle, us guys. We we have a, a coach that we can go to twenty four seven, and we get yeah. to decide if that coach is passive and pretty crappy, or if they're extraordinary and able to go. You know what you need, my love. Put words to it. So, the master classes that I do help us have quite gracious language about f you basically uh, in a in a very healthy way, which is no thank you. You know, that the act of sort of saying no to a party or no to an invite can be a very gracious one, which is, thanks for thinking of me. That doesn't work for me. It's not my thing. Period. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially for people pleasers and pretzelers or whatever. So, so setting boundaries, so recognizing your emotions, right? Setting boundaries around the things that are not in a line, that don't make you feel good, right? Like yeah. setting boundaries around the things that that are pulling you into a feeling or in a state that you don't want to be in is one of the probably like one of the cornerstones of crafting like a healthy frame for a relationship is that, that basically that's what we're saying right yeah and again i think we need to be really compassionate because we've been trained to be passive and mm -hmm. uh, full up and you know I, I met with a client yesterday and she her whole body was like this because she's trained herself for decades to hold it all in and her body was showing that and that mm -hmm. not only is chronic you know physiological uh, chiropractic out of alignment quite you know symbolically but it's you know the rage that builds in all of us we have mixed feelings about most things and we get to have a look at them but we need a training for it yeah, ab absolutely. So, so sort of like taking that sequential thing. So looking at, uh, looking at your feelings, right? Being able to identify what feels good to you and what doesn't and sort of where it comes from. Setting boundaries with other people. So because we're talking about communication and connection and relationships. So one way to sort of help that is to, to set boundaries, right? Sort of in alignment with your feelings and how you want to feel. Yeah. And being able to express your feelings to that other person to do that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And what, what, what else, like what, what, how else can we help, help each other in relationship to, to communicate and connect better? Or what else would you say like in alignment with that? I think a, a nice method is to envisage what you want for the relationship, what you see for the relationship. Cause oftentimes we don't have to have these conflicting, difficult conversations from a place of, I don't want that. We can say, you know, this is the vision that I have for us. This is the relationship yeah. that I have in my heart that I'd like us to create. And when we have those kinds of conversations, oftentimes, if you're reflective, because a lot of people are very shut down and just aren't sophisticated emotionally enough to have these mm -hmm. conversations, and that's not yeah. to point a finger or put down, it's just our training. Um, mm -hmm. We can see, we can read between the lines often. If I say, you know, to my partner, you know, this is the relationship I see for us. How about you? And he says, or she says, you know, this is the, we get to see what's missing because the reality that we have perhaps isn't that. And this is often about sex life as well and tactility with touch and how people respond to different ways of being. A lot of couples been together for years. They don't talk about what they like. And they yeah. have these little quiet fantasies and actually they like the same thing or they're interested, you know, it's just a case mm -hmm. of what do you see for yourself in a relationship? What's to your ideal? And to have a discussion about it. And oftentimes people mm -hmm. are really pleasantly surprised to see that their partner is really interested or intrigued by what you want and vice versa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So creating like a shared vision for the relationship, right? I mean, because that's the thing, if what's old that brings up an interesting point sort of in, in alignment with that. So if one person's vision of, of a relationship is one thing and the other person's is another thing, right? If, if there, is, if there are differences, it's, is, is it sort of incumbent on both parties to be able to like meet in the middle and, and sort of bring those visions together in order for it to like work. Right. I mean, well, it's a brilliant question. We, we usually, if we're not reflecting on, our psychology and the, our pain points and learning curves will attract basically the parent. Mm, so here you are I dating see. your mom or whatever it is. So mm -hmm. oftentimes there are relationships where when you look at what each other wants, you realize there's a TA model, transactional analysis model, uh, parent, adult, child. And oftentimes when people have these discussions, when it's the first, second, third, fourth relationship, 
you realize you're being a parent and they're being a child. And therefore, you're going to have yeah. this discrepancy that parents don't sleep with their kids, right? So uh -huh. something doesn't work. So the ideal is that you contact one another from the adult position to say, this is what I'm interested in. Sometimes it's kind of, well, I don't like that, but I'll give it a go because, you know, I love them or I'm interested in them. And sometimes it doesn't work and anything in between. The important thing is to break the trend where you are losing your whole orbit because of what yeah. other people want. It's just a recipe mm -hmm. for disaster. And that's where yeah. we miss opportunities because we're in the wrong place with the wrong person and life as we want it is happening over here. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's such an important thing to recognize is because I think people think a lot of people are in that space because they have this scarcity mentality of, well, this person is giving me, I have 60% of what I want right now in a relationship. And if I don't have that, then there's nothing else out there that's any better, right? There's no chance for me to have 90% or 110% everything I want and more stuff. Yeah. that I didn't even know that I want. So I think I see a lot of people in relationships, uh, in my clients and, and people that I see out in the world are settling for 60, 65, 70, hell, 30% of what they want because they have this scarcity or worthiness dialogue running in their head that there, there isn't anything greater out there. And it's so important, I think, to check in with yourself and ask yourself, am I settling for 60%? And what would 100% look like? And, and really like recognizing that you're worthy of that. Yeah. And this right, again right? is a, an epidemic is we don't want to have the conversations that matter because they're uncomfortable. So mm -hmm. that, that kind of um, technique, I suppose, of twin is really profound here is, you know, what would your healthy best self twin be? You know, again, if you're at the pearly gates and the universal yeah. force says, this is what you could have had if you had a pair, who would you be <laughs> if, you were yeah. going hand on heart with what's right for you. How would you live your life? What would you say yes to, no to, and act as if this is ultimately the law of attraction? How would you be behaving 100%. if you were already this wonderful person that you yeah. want to be? Start making decisions from that place. And there's no 60%. There's 100%. Yeah, yeah the 60% doesn't. It? The 60% is not a reflection uh, of your of your highest self. It's not a reflection of your highest possibility. You know, it, it truly isn't. And in alignment with what you're saying about having these hard conversations, Michelle has a great point here that I'm sure some of the ladies will definitely uh, resonate with. I like what you're both saying, but sometimes when boundaries, sometimes when some boundaries are set, the man runs. And uh, <laughs> I can, I mean, as a man, I'll say, I'll speak, I'll speak to that. That if a man runs from boundaries, then I, I feel like one of two things happen. Either maybe the communication about the boundaries from your from the woman's end was done from a space of fear or insecurity, yeah. and the man picked up on that energy, and it sort of caused him to it, he, that fear and insecurity transmitted over to him, yeah. which caused him to back off, you know. So because and so because he got that that fear po popped into his head, or secondarily, he's just a dude who doesn't want to be locked down, yeah. and you called him on it, yeah. So he kind of like he kind of cut and run. Yeah. Those are the two things from a male perspective, but what would you say to that? I, I would say, certainly, I would agree with that. It's usually the dialogue, it's the words we use, because uh, the intention is usually a brilliant one, the way we go about it. And unless really you've had a training in boundaries, we don't know boundaries in our culture. Most people think a boundary is an ultimatum, or yeah. a boundary is uh, some kind of... Um, you know, well, I guess ultimatum to, to differing degrees. There's this kind of do this or you're for it kind of thing, as mm -hmm. opposed to a quite sophisticated discussion around, you know, this is what I like, this is what I don't like, how about you? And then there is this space for understanding because ultimately the boundary creates security in the relationship when you know what's okay and what's not okay. Not in this kind of defense. If we get defensive with setting a boundary, it ain't a boundary. You're acting out. And we, and yeah. we do that. So yeah. usually we just need to understand. It's like we yeah. can only do what we know. We don't know any yeah. better. So there's no shame in this. It's fantastic to be able to go, wow, this is a learning curve good for me i'm recognizing it and we go forward and find somebody that can teach us this absolutely and I, and i like what what comes up for me as you say that is the concept of like the carrot versus the stick 
And like, are you setting boundaries from a positive place or from a negative space? Like if you're, if you're telling your partner, I like this and I like that and I like this, then you're giving your partner, you know, a positive boundary of the things that you shouldn't be doing, right? And, yeah. and rather than just saying, because especially from a man's perspective, if, you're, if a woman is constantly telling you, don't do this, 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 do this this way, do this this way, do this this way, it's very emasculating Absolutely. to a man and disempowering yeah. and like a, something that men depend upon from women from a masculine feminine perspective like from the interdependence of men and women is like men w rely on women to help us feel free to sort of like get us up out of our head get us up out of our work and our stuff and all of our shit and our duties and our responsibilities and be free to feel and like that's the sort of safety that women foster for men is the freedom to like be lighter yes. you know and so when all boundaries are laid in a negative disciplined you know you're not doing this well enough you could be doing this better i don't like that da, da, da. it'll it, I mean, that's when men start to check out when they start to feel that burdened burdened yes. by the by the process yes and this is where i'd say you know our greatest power is looking at our own stuff because if you find yourself in a relationship with someone you feel you need to control the first thing we get to do is to say where am i doing the very thing that i'm seeing outside of me and don't like and get mm -hmm. to work on that because yeah. if we wait around for other people to change in the way we want, it's a setup again for a lot of pain and resentment as opposed to if there's trust issues in the relationship, where are you untrustworthy? Not mm -hmm. necessarily with the person, but with yourself. When you say you'll do something, do you do it? And it's as small as I'm going to get up at 5 a.m. this week because whatever reason, and you get up at 6, you're not trustworthy. You're not integrous. You've out, you're out of integrity with yourself. Exactly. So your relationship, where is your relationship with yourself exactly. being projected onto your relationship with that person? And where are the things that are triggering, triggering you in that person, things that you see and that trigger you within yourself, right? Yeah. I mean, Big the time. whole mirroring concept. It always comes back to us. And listen, you know, I'm her. I do this stuff too, which is why I know oh, yeah. about it. But again, it, there's no shame. But that's where our power lies is to go, what, what do I get to work on? Because we attract what we are. So there's mm -hmm. never going to be my partner's difficult and I'm fantastic. You're going to be as messed up and as avoidant and dismissive and defensive as them, period. There's no way around that. So, yeah. so uh -huh. the stronger and emotionally savvy and fit we can be, you cannot help but attract someone at your same psychological state of fitness, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that, I love all this. And, and uh, so uh, Tucker has a great question here uh, for you, Poppy. Uh, what is your opinion on this? Okay, Tucker, and I, I've known this about Tucker for a while, and I think it's fascinating. And uh, he's, he's big into the sexual transmutation. Okay. What? So, wait, wait, give me a definition. What's mutation mean? Okay. So basically, uh, and it's from the way I, where I first read it is uh, from Think and Grow Rich. So Napoleon okay. Hill was a big proponent of this, basically that our sex energy is a sacred creative force mm -hmm. and that one of the greatest ways that we can enhance our creativity and power as beings. And I think he was speaking to men because it was the 1920s and that was who you were, he was writing for men, you know, but I, I think it, I guess, would apply to both. Yeah. But, so that, you know, by, 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 by not allowing our sexual energy, energy to be released, it actually elevates us a little bit. And so Tucker says, he's asking your opinion on this. Sex is nice, but I noticed that after the act, but I noticed that after the act, I lose that urge to be near someone. Due to this, I have stayed single and celibate along with removing masturbation for over six years, uh, sexual transmutation. Is this a way to have a, is there a way to have a partner and keep that spark or urge uh, to be around them without being celibate? Well, firstly, I'd say this is really common. A lot of my clients are men. So hello, welcome to the human race on that one. <laughs> it's, it's a brilliant question. I love it. It equally is intriguing to explore the association you have with sex because oftentimes yep. it is you know we go for people who are attractive we, we sort of select who we feel is not going to hurt us basically so and it depends there's many many ways to look at this i wish we had more time um but what i often find is sometimes you're there just because you want sex and if that's your set thing then okay oftentimes there is a sort of unattractiveness about having conquered as it were 
that thing. It's, it's no longer attractive anymore. And or it's not comfortable to meet that person in another state, which is either a loving one or a caressing one that isn't sexual. So I want to look at what's the history of the way that you relate around pleasure, basically. When you have yep. pleasure, what does that then mean? Is there guilt about it? Was there sort of um, discomfort around receiving, basically? Because sometimes people yeah. feel, well, I've had, I, I've had something, therefore I can't have more, and, rather, and, risk, and not risking being told, no, I won't be attracted. And we actually think that we're done. But actually, we yeah. want more because we train ourselves to cut off, basically. So for me, yeah. it's a pretty sophisticated question. And obviously, a really important one is to just have a just, it's quite complicated, but to have a look at what are the association, what's the feeling, basically, because it's not just going to be you don't feel anything and you just want sex. We're not built like that. There will yeah. be something else. So I'd want to explore with him. Uh, a little bit of a relationship history and see where the patterns are. Cause there always is one. We just repeat and repeat. Absolutely. And, and I mean, I don't think something that comes up for me around as, as he's, as he shared that question is that for a lot of times for men, I know everybody thinks of men as just like, Oh, we're looking to go out there. I mean, not all of us, but men collectively are going out there, you know, trying to pound it out and then, and then bounce. Like that's like a common thing. Mm -hmm. But I find with the men that I know in my life, a lot of them, that and for men generally that men physicality is for a lot of us like it's a it's a deep for it's a deep expression of intimacy for us more so than like the word stuff is scarier and harder for us as a way of communicating intimacy than physicality touch yeah. sex like that for a lot of men is like one of the deepest and most intimate ways that they know how to communicate intimacy right and way less scary than than like talking so I mean, for me, I know it was back in earlier stages of my own development, like it was way easier for me to have sex with somebody and show them intimacy that way than to actually tell them that I love them, than to tell them how them to share with them my feelings, because that was something where I wasn't sure how that was going to be responded to. So I like to keep my intimacy like at that level rather than open myself up to a deeper layer of intimacy through actually talking with them about feelings, because that was like terrifying for yeah. me on, on some level, you know? Sex, money, and food. They're the major areas where we're the most uncomfortable, I think. Sex, money, and food. And it, mm -hmm. again, it's just getting curious. What does sex mean to me? What is my association with that? It's a complex area that we just get to explore. Um, yeah. Yeah. Being like a scientist about your, own, about your own life and your own urges and your own feelings. And I think that's sort of like the theme that's coming up around communication and connection and relationships is that you can't really be effective in relationship with somebody else until you can only be effective with somebody else to the extent that you're effective and connected and understanding of yourself. Absolutely. Like, like that's, that's it. So it's like, we, we want to talk about, you know, this other person and what can I do and say to do, to do, to do with this person. But it really comes back to you. Like, how am I talking to myself? How well do I know my own feelings? Right. And, and, and then from, from that spec, you have to be self-aware before you're going to be able to be, uh, fully connected with another human. Yeah, and it's all research at the end of the day. We, you know, we attract what we need, usually, as painful as sometimes that can be, yeah. is that's where we are. That's, that's, we're in perfectly the right place. We get to just see what's the message here uh, yeah. in this and share it with people. This is what's so important, is to be able to have these conversations because we all have in them anyway, in our head alone and judging them. 100% judging them all the time. And Tucker responded, he said, I don't search for a partner or try to sleep with anyone. I want a connection that's genuine. Sex is just a byproduct. It isn't really very important to me. I just can't stand how I want to spiritually be with someone so bad. But then after sex, the fire is gone. But you can't just be with somebody and never have sex. They won't allow that. So that is an interesting sort of paradox that I feel like he's, uh, he's coming up against. Yeah. Like sex isn't a priority for him as a man, which is, I mean, that's pretty unique. Well, <laughs> like, uh, there's actually, I would disagree. But again, it's interesting because yeah. the kinds of clients we attract are going to be the kinds of clients we attract. I find there's a lot of men. Uh, in fact, I, I imagine there's a couple of men on who feel that way, that religion, for example, or spirituality connection is way more important. And there is a celibacy often. 
And sometimes mm. that, that rules out a lot of women who find that a bit kind of, that doesn't work. So we need yeah. to be careful sometimes to sort of classify women like this and men like that. We are all so very different. Um, Amen. So again, I would explore that one is when he, when he says genuine, the, for me, the work would be, words mean a lot, you know, the words that we use is where am I uh, genuine? Where am I not so genuine? And that can often be in going out and meeting people to say, this is actually what I'm about. Does that fit for you? Well, not really. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Next. Uh, you know, oftentimes when we sit in the sidelines hoping to meet somebody who wants that, and later down the line we realize that's not possible, we can have these conversations up front to say, this is what I'm after. And mm -hmm. we're likely to attract what we want if we're thinking about what we want, if that makes sense. I hope that's useful for him. But it's common, I would say. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that's so interesting. So, so in those situations where you've got a partner where the man or the woman is just simply not interested in sex, it's not a priority for them, and then their partner is, like, how, does that, how is that reconciled? Or how do, you, how do you coach them into, like, going out into the world and, like, basically going out into, into the world basically stating, I don't want to have that level of intimacy with my partner like do you are you just up front with with people potential people that you're interested in with that or i mean it just seems like an interesting like how how do you guide people around that in terms of first meeting in terms of meeting and communicating that to other people like as far as like setting expectations and boundaries for a relationship you know because that's a that's an interesting thing to you sure. know well firstly i would get clear within yourself which takes a bit what's going on before we try and sort of dictate what we want because a lot of us we don't know really or dare mm -hmm. to think about it because it's so taboo there's a lot of reasons why people you know sex isn't a priority sometimes it just isn't and there are other things that come first sometimes there's abuse or discomfort or situations that have been really uncomfortable or unpleasant so people shy away from it and turn off the yeah. kind of sexual part of them and so on so i would say firstly we get really clear what is it you like what is it you want uh, is there anything you're blocking uh, because you're going to attract exactly that if you are uh, and then it's very subjective the degree to which you're comfortable it's not about comfort really you want to have conversations like this up front a lot of people are very open about it this is what i like sexually and you know i'm highly yeah. sexed or not so much and i need that and other people need to have an established number of contact with the person before that's a conversation they want to open up. So yeah. we do what we need to do because mm -hmm. it's the right thing for us as opposed to because it's awkward and difficult and uncomfortable and I don't want to do it and I'm avoiding. And that's when it backfires. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think a part of what Napoleon Hill speaks into in sexual transmutation is that it isn't that sex is bad. It's that the sexual force has been one of the greatest uh, engines for inspiration and, and creation in the world, you know, like not just in the creation of human beings, but some of the greatest works of art were, were created by people, by, by men and women who were, who were deeply in love with uh, a woman, you know, or a, or, a, or a person or a relationship, you know, that love and, and, and that sexual energy is one of the most powerful driving forces in humanity and to sort of harness it and be conscious of it and don't just like, throw it out willy nilly is sort of the thing. Yeah. Uh, was, is like the, I think the basis of the, of the concept. So it's definitely an interesting, uh, an interesting phenomenon. Uh, okay. Uh, Tucker says by genuine, I mean being crazy about one another and being able to fuel each other's fire. It isn't that I don't enjoy sex. It's great. I don't enjoy losing that fire, that glow you see in someone. It's just the feeling I get for a good eight or so hours after the fact that he doesn't like, I guess. So I guess he feels empty towards the other person uh, after he has sex with them for a little while. Yeah. Which is, so I yeah. would be there curious what happens within him. Tucker, hi, my love. What happens within you? Because there will be plenty of women or partners, whether, you know, whatever kind of people they are, who are there front and center, very much still engaged after being intimate. So... I would really yeah. want to explore what happens within you because oftentimes we see in the other the thing that we don't see in us is you know a lot of people turn off or aren't as present to 
me and actually well what's going on within you you know it's mm -hmm. not to lay blame or anything it's just to get curious where do I go in myself afterward because sometimes you can be with somebody and they're in exactly the same place as you but there's a sort of uh, fear of talking about it so we pretend we're, we do life thinking that's what the other person wants and actually both are lying there going I really want to connect here but you're not supposed to talk and you know maybe I should sleep whatever it's yeah 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 yeah, yeah. So. so I mean bottom bottom line is let's not villainize the semen this isn't about the semen this is about <laughs> no. I just wanted to say that because I think that's hilarious but uh <laughs> but you know it is it's about what's what's in the what's in the what's emotionally coming up in the after math of the of the intimacy of the act right yeah. and where is that coming from and working and how can i work through it and how can i uh how can i communicate that to my partner because maybe in talking about it i mean pillow talk you know post-coital pillow talk can be some of the most intimate transformational conversations that you can have in that sort of post-coital intimate state yeah right that you that you you got with somebody and if you're not feeling intimate that could be one of the most powerful things you could say hey so i feel totally shut down right now you know and and have the have the opportunity to work that through with your with your partner sort of in the moment you know it's felt if it's not said it's felt so we may as yeah, well just get on and you know <laughs> confront you it I'm mindful. I have a client, so I'm gonna. I was gonna say, yeah. I think we're. I think we're running a little long, but it's been so much fun that like I, I couldn't. I couldn't stop. But but I'd love for you, Bobby, as we wind down to if you have a final thought around around what we've been talking about around communication and connection in in in, uh, in relationship that you want to share with everybody. I'd I'd love to hear it. Uh, yeah. Well, we need practice, I think, is the punchline. And there's so many ways you can do this because we're talking about intimate relationships. But we, but, you know, we, what is that saying? We do life, the way we do one thing is the way we do everything. So getting mm -hmm. amongst people, groups, online is just as powerful where you do lives about what you're going through in life and what you've learned and you connect and get, get connected with people in a place of truth that's going to translate with how you do Thanksgiving and how you do uh, intimate relationships. So it, it always makes me curious when people are abstinent from something, whatever that thing mm -hmm. is, is what we're doing in place of it. So it may be that you're single. <laughs> what are you doing in place of that? Just in terms of being around people and thinking about what you want and writing down really what is it that you're looking for and talking about it. Where am I blocking that? Where mm. am I repeating patterns that my parents uh, did? Or where am I, you know, tripping up or not speaking the truth? And we just practice. It's, practice is the mother of all skill, right? Communication mm -hmm. is communication. So however yeah. we do that in whatever setting will be really relevant, as relevant, intimately. Absolutely. Thank you, Poppy. I appreciate that so much. And guys, yeah, I guess my, and my final thought would be on that relationships and human connection. Uh, Kate says connection is key, and I couldn't agree with her more. I mean, Brene Brown said it best. I mean, in all the research that she did, the foundation of why we're here as human beings yes. is to connect with other human beings. Like, that is the meaning of life. That's why we're here for a lot of people. And everybody, whether they say it or not, they're craving it. And yes. if they're not getting it, it causes great pain for somebody. So wherever that looks like in your life, however you can connect deeper with other people, go for it because connections to other people, especially intimate relationships and intimate connections can be some of the most transformative uh, experiences of your life. And the first and greatest, you know, connection and relationship you get to have is with yourself. Yeah. So the thing that kept coming up again and again and again, right, was that we can't really, we can only be in relation with other people to the extent that we are in relationship with ourselves. And I mean, if you can keep coming back to that, yes. you're gonna have you're gonna have a greater insight into what patterns are you're having in relations with other people. Yes. Because it's all a mirror for you. Yes. Right. So And there's no so. way around that one. That is the human yeah. condition. So <laughs> we just need to get with the program. Yeah. Get with the program. Yes. Get with the program. And to everybody watching, Kate, Tucker, Linda. Uh, all the people who've been watching and commenting, thank you, Michelle, thank you guys so much for joining us. And Poppy, thank you so much for coming on. This was everything I thought it would be. I, I love you to death, my dear. Likewise. How people, uh, yeah, how can people like connect with you and stay? What's the best way for people to stay like 
connected with you and everything you're up to? Well, I have a poppy page on Facebook where all kinds of stuff to do with courses I offer and, you know, just inspirational whatever is on there, poppy. Uh, info at poppyspray.com is how people can get in touch for whatever reason. Just put it out there and I'll do my best to uh, share what I know. Awesome. Well, Poppy, thank you so much. This has been so much fun. Thank you. <laughs> Pleasure. Thanks for having me, truly. That was wonderful. Uh, uh, so great. See you yeah. again. I'll see you soon. And for everybody watching, thank you for being a part of Wasabi Wednesday. We're so grateful for all y'all. This show is all about you. If you have any additional questions for me or Poppy or both of us, please put them in the comments, especially for those of you watching on the replay. Yes. And we'll be happy to uh, to, to answer them. Big and time. share this, guys. If this show resonated with you, if you got value out of this that you want to share with your people and your tribe, share it. Let's get this stuff out to more people because there's not enough conversations like this going on online. Am I right? One million percent. We need to lead from the front. And truly... Any Truly. And this is actually where it starts, really, is we get uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I don't want to put that on my Facebook feed because what will people think? If we yeah. put out there what we're interested in, what moves us, we're going to attract the people who are interested in that. So when we say, oh, I've got this vacuous, you know, I'm not meeting people that have my kind of values and interests, it's because we're not talking about it. So put it on your feed. If this, you know, is important, then fantastic. People will gravitate towards it. And hey, presto, you've connected. <laughs> Brilliant. The people who are meant to hear it will hear it, right? And, and so, guys, everybody have a wonderful, wonderful uh, week. We'll see you next week on Wasabi Wednesday. And Poppy, uh, thank you again. It was such a pleasure. My pleasure, too. Big, big love. All right. Bye-bye, guys.